You watch your bird preen its feathers in the morning sun, and you see it tiny gaps along the wing, a few loose down feathers on the floor. Molting has begun. You feel relief. It's a natural process. It happens every year. You've seen it before. But what if this quiet annual ritual is the moment your next racing season is being decided? Not in the loft, but in the biology of a single feather. 95% of fanciers treat molting as a passive phase. Reduce racing, feed a little more protein and weight. But molting is not passive. It is one of the most energy-intensive, hormonally complex, and nutritionally demanding processes in a pigeon's life. And if it's mismanaged, the damage doesn't show in the moment. It shows next spring when your birds return late, fly weakly, or vanish on short tosses. The first and most widespread mistake is ignoring the timing of molting. Molting is not random. It is triggered by decreasing daylight after the summer solstice. In the Northern Hemisphere, it begins in late June or early July and lasts six to 10 weeks. But many fanciers continue racing their birds deep into July, pushing them through long distance events while their bodies are already diverting massive resources to feather growth. A feather is 90% protein, Growing a full set of new flight feathers requires more amino acids than building muscle or recovering from a 500-kilometer race. When a bird is forced to race while molting, it must choose repair wings or grow feathers. It cannot do both. The result is incomplete molting, weak, brittle feathers that break in flight, or delayed molting that spills into winter, leaving the bird vulnerable to cold and disease. The top fanciers know this. They end their young bird racing season by mid-June. They give their veterans a full rest by early July. They treat molting not as an interruption, but as the foundation of the next season. The second error is misunderstanding the hormonal shift. Molting is controlled by prolactin, melatonin, and thyroid hormones, not by feet alone. As daylight shortens, melatonin rises, signaling the body to stop breeding and start molting. If the loft is exposed to artificial light at night, street lights, security lamps, indoor lighting, this signal is disrupted. The bird's internal clock confuses summer with spring, delaying or fragmenting the molt. One fancier in the Netherlands noticed his birds were molting erratically, some in July, some in September. He discovered a new street light had been installed outside his loft. He added blackout curtains, and the next year, molting began uniformly in early July. Light is not just illumination, it is a command. The third mistake is confusing molting with illness. A molting bird is naturally quieter, less active, and may eat slightly less. Its droppings may be softer due to increased protein metabolism. Many fanciers see this and assume disease. They add antibiotics, vitamins, or stress-inducing treatments that further disrupt the delicate hormonal balance. But molting is not sickness, it is renewal. The bird doesn't need medicine, it needs peace. A calm loft, consistent routine, and clean water are more valuable than any supplement. Interfering with a healthy molt does more harm than good. The fourth error is rushing the process. Some fanciers try to speed up molting with high-protein feeds, extra vitamins, or even hormone injections. But feathers cannot be rushed. They grow at a fixed rate, about one centimeter every three to four days. Forcing growth with excess protein overloads the kidneys, causes uric acid buildup, and leads to gout or joint pain. The body must have time to absorb, process, and deposit nutrients slowly. Patience is not passive, it is biological respect. But the deepest mistake is failing to see molting as preparation. The feathers grown this summer will carry your bird through next year's races. Strong, smooth, aerodynamic feathers mean faster flight, better wind resistance, and less fatigue. Weak, rough, or broken feathers mean drag, instability, and early exhaustion. The quality of next season's performance is being written in keratin right now, and that quality depends not on bloodlines but on care. This isn't about perfection, it's about alignment. Align your loft with the seasons. Align your expectations with biology. Align your actions with respect. So as you watch your bird drop its first flight feather, Ask yourself, am I seeing a pause or a promise? Because the fancier who understands molting doesn't just wait for feathers to grow. They build the future, one silent, sacred strand at a time. The mistake of passive molting ends not with a new feed mix, but with a new perspective. That rest is not empty. Feathers are not grown from feed alone. They are woven from amino acids, minerals, and time. And the balance of these elements determines whether a feather will carry a bird through a storm or shatter in the wind. The mistake most fanciers make during molting is not what they feed, but how they misunderstand the nutritional demands of this sacred process. They hear feathers are protein and dump peas, beans, and soy into the mix, believing more is better. But molting is not a protein contest. It is a symphony of nutrients, and if one note is too loud, the whole song falls apart. The first and most critical error is excessive protein. Yes, feathers are 90% protein, but the body cannot store excess amino acids. What it cannot use, it converts to uric acid, 
and excretes through the kidneys. During molting, when the kidneys are already working overtime to process metabolic waste, this overload can lead to gout, joint pain, and even kidney failure. The ideal protein level during molting is 16 it's 18 percent, not the 20 to 25 percent many fanciers use. This means a mix of 40 percent peas, 30 percent wheat, 20 percent barley, and 10 percent lentils, not pure peas or raw soybeans which are too dense and hard to digest. And never use raw soy. It contains trypsin inhibitors that block protein absorption. Only use toasted or extruded soy, and even then sparingly. The second mistake is ignoring fat quality. Many fanciers reduce fat during molting, fearing weight gain, but fat is essential for feather sheen, skin health, and hormone production. The error isn't fat itself, it's the type of fat. Corn and sunflower seeds are high in omega-6 fatty acids, which promote inflammation. During molting when the skin is regenerating and follicles are active, inflammation slows feather growth and causes dry, brittle feathers. The solution is to replace these with omega-3 rich seeds, flaxseed, hemp seed, or canola. Just 5-10% of the mix should be flaxseed, enough to reduce inflammation, support skin elasticity, and give feathers a natural gloss, but never exceed 10%. Too much flax can loosen droppings and upset digestion. The third error is vitamin imbalance. Vitamin A is essential for skin and follicle health. Vitamin E protects new feathers from oxidative stress. B-complex vitamins support nerve function and energy metabolism, but most fanciers either over-supplement or under-supplement. Dumping vitamin powders into every meal leads to toxic buildup of fat-soluble vitamins like A and D. Skipping vitamins entirely leads to dull, slow-growing feathers. The ideal approach is food-first supplementation. Offer chopped spinach, kale, or dandelion greens twice a week for natural vitamin A and K. Add wheat germ to the mix for vitamin E. Use a liquid B-complex in the water two or three times a week but never daily, and never mix with vinegar or electrolytes, which degrade the vitamins. If you must use a commercial vitamin, Choose one formulated for molting birds and follow the dose exactly. More is not better, balance is. The fourth mistake is neglecting minerals. Calcium is needed not just for bones, but for feather structure. Zinc supports keratin production. Selenium acts as an antioxidant, but minerals must be in harmony. Too much calcium without magnesium leads to poor absorption. Too much zinc blocks copper uptake, causing feather discoloration. The best source is natural and balanced. Crushed oyster shell for calcium, offered freely in a separate container a pinch of brewer's yeast for zinc and B vitamins, and a few sunflower seeds in moderation for selenium. Never add mineral powders directly to feed unless a deficiency is confirmed by a vet. The body regulates minerals best when they come from whole foods. But the deepest error is inconsistent feeding. Molting birds need routine. The same mix, the same time, the same portions, day after day. Yet many fanciers change feeds weekly, trying new molting mixes or adding random supplements. This confuses the gut disrupts digestion, and slows nutrient absorption. Choose one balanced molting mix and stick with it for the entire 8-10 weeks. Adjust only if droppings become loose. Reduce protein, or feathers look dull. Add flaxseed. Stability is more powerful than variety during this phase. Now consider hydration. Molting increases metabolic water loss. A bird growing feathers drinks more, not less. Yet many fanciers reduce water access, fearing damp bedding. The result is dehydration, which causes feathers to grow slowly and break easily. Always offer fresh, clean water twice a day. Add a pinch of sea salt once a week to support electrolyte balance, but never vinegar, which acidifies the system when it needs neutrality. And never forget observation. Watch the feathers as they grow. A healthy new feather has a dark, blood-filled shaft, the blood feather that gradually hardens and lightens. If blood feathers stay dark too long, it may indicate poor circulation or vitamin K deficiency. If feathers grow crooked or twisted, it may signal mineral imbalance or stress. These are not flaws, they are messages. This isn't about feeding more, it's about feeding wisely. Every gram of feed should serve the feather, not the fancier's anxiety. So as you prepare your molting mix today, ask yourself, am I feeding for speed or for strength? Because the bird that flies next season doesn't need flashy feathers. It needs feathers that hold the sky. The fancier who masters molting nutrition doesn't just grow feathers, they grow wings that carry trust, endurance, and home. Molting is not just a biological process. It is a conversation between the bird and its environment. Every ray of light, every sound, every degree of temperature speaks to the bird's body, shaping how feathers grow, how quickly they harden, and how strong they become. And yet most fanciers focus only on feed, ignoring the silent signals of the loft itself. The mistake isn't in the bowl, it's in the air, the walls, the rhythm of the space. The first and most overlooked error is light exposure. Molting is triggered and regulated by photoperiod, the length of daylight, 
In nature, pigeons molt as days shorten after the summer solstice. But in lofts near streetlights, security lamps, or indoor lighting, this signal is distorted. Artificial light at night suppresses melatonin, the hormone that initiates molting. The result is delayed, fragmented, or incomplete molting. Some feathers grow, others stall, and the bird enters winter with gaps in its flight suit. The solution is simple. Ensure complete darkness at night. Use blackout curtains, cover windows, or relocate the loft away from light pollution. Even a small LED on a charger can disrupt the cycle. The bird needs 12 to 14 hours of uninterrupted darkness to molt properly. One fancier in Germany noticed his birds were molting erratically for three years. He finally traced it to a neighbor's motion sensor light that flashed every night. After installing a light-blocking screen, molting became uniform and complete within one season. The second mistake is temperature imbalance. Molting birds need stable, moderate warmth, not heat, not cold. Ideal loft temperature during molting is 18 to 22 curses. Below 15 dark seas, blood flow to the skin reduces, slowing feather growth and causing brittle shafts. Above 28 curses, the bird diverts energy to cooling, not feather production, and new feathers may grow thin or weak. Yet many fanciers overheat lofts in early autumn to keep birds comfortable or leave them exposed to cold drafts in late summer. The fix is passive climate control, Use insulated walls, adjustable vents, and shade cloth. In cold climates, add a layer of straw under the floor for insulation. In hot climates, place water pans on the floor for evaporative cooling, but never use fans that blow directly on the birds. Stress from wind or noise disrupts the calm needed for regeneration. The third error is noise and disturbance. A molting bird is in a state of deep biological focus. Its body is rebuilding its very interface with the sky. Loud noises, barking dogs, slamming doors, shouting machinery, trigger the stress response releasing cortisol. This hormone shuts down non-essential functions, including feather growth. Even frequent handling or loft cleaning during molting creates anxiety that slows the process. The top fanciers enforce a molting quiet zone. No visitors, no unnecessary handling, no major changes to the loft. They enter only to change water and feed, moving slowly and speaking softly. They treat the loft not as a workspace, but as a sanctuary. One fancier in Belgium reduced his molting period from 10 weeks to seven, Simply by moving his loft away from a busy road, the birds weren't fed differently. In a crowded loft, birds cannot establish stable social hierarchies. Constant low-level aggression, pecking, chasing, blocking perches, creates chronic stress that elevates cortisol and suppresses molting hormones. Shy or young birds suffer most, often molting last or incompletely. The rule is simple, one square meter per bird during molting. Not for flying, for peace. Better to separate birds into smaller groups than to force them to share tight space. Some fanciers even isolate molting champions in individual compartments to eliminate all social stress. The result is faster, smoother, and shinier feather growth. But the deepest error is ignoring disease during molting. A bird's immune system is naturally suppressed during feather growth, making it more vulnerable to canker, paratyphoid, and respiratory infections. Yet many fanciers stop all treatments during molting, fearing supplements will interfere. The truth is, untreated disease does far more harm than careful treatment. If a bird shows signs of illness, loose droppings, nasal discharge, lethargy, it must be treated immediately, even during molt. Use gentle pigeon-specific medications and support recovery with probiotics and clean water. Prevention is even better. Maintain strict loft hygiene, control pests, and avoid introducing new birds during molting season. Now consider air quality. Ammonia from wet droppings irritates the respiratory tract and skin, causing inflammation that disrupts feather follicles. Dust from feed or bedding clogs airways and reduces oxygen intake, slowing metabolism. The solution is daily bedding changes, deep litter management, and cross-ventilation without drafts. Keep the loft dry, clean, and well-aired, but never drafty. A calm, clean atmosphere is as vital as protein, and never underestimate the power of free flight. Even during molting, short, gentle flights in the morning sun stimulate circulation, improve feather alignment, and boost mood, but never force it. Let the bird choose. If it stays on the perch, respect its need for rest. This isn't about control. It's about creating conditions where biology can do its work undisturbed. So as you look at your loft today, ask yourself, is this a place of calm or chaos? Because the feathers growing now will carry your bird through next year's storms, and they deserve to grow in peace. The fancier who masters the molting environment doesn't just provide shelter, they provide silence. And in that silence, wings are reborn. The final truth about molting is this. It does not end when the last feather hardens. It ends when the bird is ready to fly again, not just with new feathers, but with renewed strength, clarity, and trust. And yet most fanciers make a critical error at this threshold. They rush back into racing before the bird is truly ready.
They see a full coat of feathers and assume the work is done. But molting is not a finish line. It is a bridge. And if that bridge is crossed too soon, the entire next season collapses. The first and most common mistake is ignoring the post-molt recovery phase. After 8 to 10 weeks of intense biological work, the bird's body is depleted. Its protein reserves are low. Its immune system is still rebuilding. Its muscles have atrophied from reduced activity. Throwing it into training or racing at this stage is like sending an athlete back to competition the day after surgery. The top fanciers know this. They allow a full two to three weeks of rest after molting completes. No tosses, no basket training, no stress, just free flight, clean feed, and calm. This is not wasted time. It is investment. The second error is misreading feather maturity. A feather may look complete, but its shaft may still be soft, its barbs not fully interlocked. Flying too soon can cause micro-tears that lead to breakage in wind or rain. The test is simple. Gently run your fingers along the primary flight feathers. They should feel smooth, hard, and resilient. Not flexible or brittle. If in doubt, wait. One week of patience prevents a season of loss. The third mistake is jumping straight into long-distance training. After months of rest, the bird's cardiovascular system is deconditioned. Its navigation map is rusty. Starting with 50 or 100 kilometers shocks the system and erodes confidence. The correct approach is gradual reactivation. Begin with one kilometer tosses in all eight directions, just as with young birds. Rebuild the mental map slowly. Let the bird rediscover the sky without pressure. Only after three to four successful short tosses should you increase distance. This isn't coddling. It's respect for the fragility of return. The fourth error is neglecting post-molt nutrition. The bird no longer needs high protein, but it does need balanced energy and gut support. Switch from the molting mix 16 to 18% protein, to a light racing base, 45% wheat, 25% barley, 20% peas, 10% lentils. Reduce flaxseed to 5%. Add probiotics to the water for one week to restore gut balance after the metabolic strain of molting. And never reintroduce corn or safflower until the bird is flying consistently. Fat creates heat and slows digestion when the body is still sensitive. But the deepest mistake is failing to evaluate. Molting reveals the truth about a bird. The one that molts early, evenly, and with glossy feathers is a keeper. The one that molts late, patchily, or with dull, brittle feathers may have underlying health issues or poor genetics. This is the time to make hard decisions. Retire birds that struggle. Focus your energy on those that thrive. A strong loft is not built by keeping everyone. It is built by honoring excellence. Now consider the transition to breeding. In some regions, fanciers overlap molting with early breeding. This is a dangerous error. Both processes demand massive resources. Protein for feathers, calcium for eggs. The body cannot do both well. Always complete molting before introducing nest bowls. A bird that breeds while molting produces weak squabs and incomplete feathers, harming two generations at once, and never forget the emotional contract. A bird that has just molted is vulnerable. It has given its body to renewal. In return, it needs gentleness. No sudden changes, no loud voices, no forced handling. Let it rebuild its confidence at its own pace. The trust earned during this quiet time becomes the foundation of next season's partnership. This isn't about schedules. It's about listening. Watch how the bird flies during free loft time. Does it circle with energy? Does it land confidently? Does it preen with pride? These are the true markers of readiness. Not the calendar, not the feathers, but the spirit. So as you stand at your loft door, watching your bird stretch its new wings in the autumn sun, remember this is not the end of rest. It is the beginning of return. And the fancier who honors this transition doesn't just prepare for races, they prepare for trust. Because the bird that flies next spring does not carry just new feathers. It carries the memory of how it was cared for when it was most fragile. And that memory is what brings it home again and again. The mistake of rushed renewal ends not with a faster toss, but with a slower heart. And in choosing patience, you do more than protect a season. You protect the bond that makes racing meaningful. For in the end, we do not race pigeons to see how fast they fly. We race them to see how deeply they believe in coming back. And it is our duty to make that return not just possible but worthy.